Good morning. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, hopefully, the last video uh, was useful to you on nationalism in Africa and the Middle East. This particular one is going to be about Indian nationalism inside of British India uh, for section 8.3. So the last time we talked about India, hopefully you remember, the British took it over and Queen Victoria made herself the first Empress of India and combined together this entire region that we refer to as the British Raj, R-A-J. And of course, one of the consequences that hopefully you guys remember was the British Empire was interested in cash crops. They were interested in things like indigo and tea and tobacco and of course opium. Um, but of course, that also led to the situation in which we saw massive starvation within India itself. Kills over 20 million people at the end of the 19th century, at the end of the 1800s. And generally, Indian people aren't all that particularly happy with the British Raj as a result of this. Because remember, and if you remember, I hope you remember, um, India was growing more food and exporting more food than any other country on Earth until the British took over. And once the British took over, it's famines that kill 20 million people. Now, that's a pretty big deal. Um, however, we also see that this British takeover has another very unintended consequence. And that consequence is many upper class Indian folks, people in the higher tiers of that caste system, are offered the opportunity to go to Western education. So they can go to England, they can go to France, they can go to pretty much where they would like to go in the Western world to be educated. And as a consequence of that, we all know that in the Western world, one of the big things that you need when you you're getting educated is you have to understand the Enlightenment, the concept of individualism, the concept of rights, the concept of limited government. All of those become really, really, really important when you get a Western style education. So many of these upper class Indian people start to go to the Western education. They start to understand the Enlightenment and individualism and rights. And then they go back to India and they look around and they say, well, wait a minute. The British aren't practicing what they preach. You know, a lot of a lot of British people created the Enlightenment, and now they're not following it. Now they're kind of ignoring it, and we don't feel as though that's really, you know, right. And so one of the things that they do is in 1885, they get together and they organize themselves together is as what we call the First Indian National Congress. And of course, this is an Indian nationalist movement that's promoting the idea that India should be for Indian people, and that they would really like to free themselves from the burdens of being controlled and dominated by the British imperial system. Now, as you would imagine, they don't get very far, of course, because the British have a technological advantage over them. They've got a, uh, an imperialism uh, system that allows them to really dominate India. However, in 1914, the Indian National Congress sees a huge opportunity when the First World War starts, and they say, now, Let's, let's see if we can maybe come up with a solution to uh, both of our problems. The British are fighting World War I, and we want independence from the British Empire. So what we'll do is we will massively volunteer, and we will go fight for the British Empire. And in exchange, what we demand and what we expect to happen is the Indian National Congress is going to be granted a larger degree of autonomy, maybe even to the extent of what they called home rule, which is basically what the Canadians and the Australians and the um, Australians and New Zealanders got. Uh, that's what the Indians were really hoping for, is that after the war, they would be allowed to enjoy you know, what they earned by fighting for the empire in World War I. The problem, though, is after World War I, the British economy is destroyed, and so they really have to take even more advantage of, the, of British India. Now, in response, the Indians, of course, protest, and they start to get extremely upset, and so the British government actually outlaws protesting. However, the Indian folks themselves do stay organized, and they do show up to protest, and they do want to demonstrate to the British that they're not happy with the way that, you know, they fought bravely in World War I, and then the British turn around and say, well, you're not getting any additional home rule. In April of 1919, this situation really comes to a head in the, situ in the, the city of Amritsar, which is in northern India, just a little ways away from the city of New Delhi. The people organize themselves together in a protest movement, which was a violation of uh, the April 13th order from uh, British uh, Commander Reginald Dyer, who said that uh, public meetings were all banned and he had ordered all crowds to disperse. During 
the crowd leader speeches, uh, Dyer shows up with 50 World War I veterans and starts opening fire into this unarmed and also trapped crowd. Uh, four, over 400 people were dead and over 1,100 people were wounded. These were men, women, and children that were protesting their rights to independence. And of course, one of the things you can really see in the Amritsar massacre here is on the lower left-hand side of the painting, which depicts this particular event, people jumping down a well. These folks were trying to avoid getting shot, and the problem is they started jumping on top of each other, and people were actually drowning in this Amritsar massacre. Now, what the Amritsar massacre ultimately does is it shows Indian people that they're not going to be able to protest their way into independence and freedom. Now, it's at this point that if you think back to the entire history that we've done in our class so far, you would think that, well, this is where the rebellion starts, this is where the revolution starts, this is where the war starts. But ultimately, in India, that's not the way that it goes. And the reason that it does not go that way is the Indian independence movement, or the Indian National Congress, finds a leader who really takes an alternative tactic. His name was Mohandas Gandhi. Now, Gandhi was born into a middle-class English family. He studied law in England. And then after he got his law degree, he actually went to South Africa to defend people in the Indian race group of apartheid. And one of the things that he learned there is how to use the British legal system to really tie things up and to make it difficult on the British to ultimately get his way. During World War I and after World War I, he, he went back to India to fight with the goal of achieving Indian independence. And his strategy ultimately came from this idea that we talked about before, which was called Ahimsa. A-H-I-M-S-A. -S -S and Ahimsa is this religious belief from Hinduism that is all about respect for all living things, right? You don't hurt living things, uh, you know, under any circumstances. It gets you bad karma. It, it makes you reincarnate lower on the wheel of samsara. Just, just bad things happen. And so ultimately Gandhi has this idea that says, listen, we can't do violence and ultimately expect something good to come from it, right? He, he said, you know, love would conquer everything and evil would be overwhelmed by the power of good. So if we use evil, we're not going to win. We have to use good and that's ultimately going to allow us to accomplish this strategy of independence. So one of the things that he starts to really focus on is let's take away the things that the British are in India to get. So let's take away, for example, profit. So how do we take away the profit that they've got from controlling India? Well, one of the things that he does is he starts to practice what we call civil disobedience. He said, let's start to deliberately break laws that are unfair and ultimately we will overwhelm the British legal system, right? If if one of us goes out and breaks a law, that's not a big problem. The police can come and arrest us and put us in jail. If 100,000 of us go and break that law, they can't really come and arrest 100,000 people and put us all in jail. And if they do, it's going to be extremely expensive. And so that's one of the things that, that Gandhi starts to focus on. If we overwhelm the legal system, it will be so expensive and such a big problem to control India that the British will eventually lose interest and stop trying to control it. Now, the second thing that he does is he also undertakes boycotts, which means a refusal to purchase Indian goods. Here we can see him actually taking on the traditional practice of spinning his own thread to eventually weave his own cloth, which breaks the, the British um, monopoly and ultimately costs them a lot of money. And he says, listen, eventually it'll get so expensive that they'll just decide it's not worth it to control India and they'll go back to Britain and they'll leave us alone and they'll move on to the next thing and that's ultimately not going to be us. And so really this is this is a very innovative kind of a strategy that ultimately makes it expensive and problematic and difficult for the British to control India so that eventually the British will decide we don't want to go through all the headaches and problems, right? But he doesn't use violence to do it, which is really a, an amazing kind of a, an idea in the 20th century, which is really one of the most violent centuries we've ever had, that Gandhi, right in the middle of all that, says, no, we can do this better, and we can do this the right way, and we can achieve our goals. Through this, Gandhi starts to gain a large international following and a reputation, and a lot of people start to pay attention to him. And so he starts taking on bigger and bigger and bigger projects. From March the 12th through April the 6th of 1930, so we're talking about 90 years ago, Gandhi starts to put together this massive campaign to really show everybody, 
you know, and get everybody organized that he can to disrupt the British control of India. And so he stages a protest, which is called the Salt March. Now, salt is a very, very important product because it was used in preserving meat before widespread refrigeration. The law in India said that Indian people were required to purchase salt, again, a, a staple product, really, from a British merchant. And so Gandhi said, well, that's really kind of silly because we live right next door to the ocean, and so there are salt crystals right on the beach right next to the ocean. Why don't we just walk down to the ocean, pick up our own salt, and use it that way? That would have been a violation of law, but he said, you know, if we get a big enough following, the British can't really arrest us all. So he starts a 240-mile journey. He starts with 78 followers, and he's preaching this message of peace and compassion and love and the power of good over evil and that sort of thing, while he is taking this very long, very deliberate march to raise awareness and raise followers. Now, of course, that does work, and he does eventually wind up with thousands and thousands and thousands of people following after him. When he, on April 6th, gets to the ocean, he bends down on the beach, picks up a crystal of salt, and then he and the other leaders of this uh, movement were arrested and thrown into jail. Now this is where he really gets a lot of power because when he goes to jail, newspapers all over, the, all over the world start to cover this and they start to pay a lot of attention to it because Gandhi uses a technique called a hunger strike. Gandhi refuses to eat anything until the British recognize the independence of India. And so now he puts the British in a really horrible position. Are the British going to force feed him because that looks like a really bad thing you know internationally are they going to allow this guy who's literally piecing, uh, preaching nothing but peace and love and passive resistance um, are they really going to allow him to starve himself to death right one of the people who really represents peace and one of the guys who leads a revolution you know in opposition to violence are we really going to allow him to starve himself to death to death because that really doesn't look good for the British Empire either now, eventually what they do is they eventually give in and they say, okay, here's the situation. If Gandhi promises to stop the protest movements against the British, they promise to start India down the road towards independence. Now, they said one of the things we don't want to do, though, is we don't just want to cut ties and run and say, there you go, India is yours and good luck with that. What we want to do is we want to set them up with a good constitution that allows India to be stable and independent and, and basically, they're kind of copying the style that they used with Canada and Australia and New Zealand. And they say, you know, we want to set you up to be successful. And we promise that we're going to do that. We just want to make sure that we're going to take the time to do that. Now, the problem is that that promise was made in 1930, right in the middle of the Great Depression, or at the beginning of the Great Depression. And of course, very quickly uh, after the Great Depression, we're also going to get World War II, which is going to get in the way. But they at least start making progress and start holding talks and start holding discussions and meetings about how are they actually going to make Indian independence into a reality. So that's it for this particular one on India seeking self-rule after the First World War. Next video is going to be due uh, not this coming week, but it will be due, uh, it'll be the first video uh, to support what you're doing the following week. So that one's not going to be due until April 10th, um, but we're going to get start getting into kind of the lead up into World War II. Two, and so uh, for the next video, we're going to look at the new forces in uh, China and Japan, and then we're going to start setting up uh, the rise of totalitarianism and fascism uh, to get us ready for World War II, which is topic nine. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it was it was useful to you in explaining the content. Uh, if you have any questions, please drop a, a comment on Google Classroom, and I will see you all in the next video. Stay healthy and stay safe, everybody.